and um, I'll put the screen up. Let's see if I can if I can find it here. Yes, there it is. Um, all right. Bar, welcome. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kitshanu B'Mitzvotav V'Tzivanu L'Asok B'Divrei Torah. Nice. Um, so I had said yesterday that I would try and show uh, similarities between Hanukkah and Christmas. And uh, before I do that, I think I would like to at least, because this is advertised as Torah, you know, as uh, Rashi and uh, Humash, I want to do at least one verse and let's hope it'll still give me enough time to, uh, to do what I said I would do. All right. So, v'ha'ra'av haya al kol pnei ha'aretz, the, the famine uh, was o over all the, f the face of the earth. Thank you. V'yiftach Yosef et kol asher bahem, and Joseph opened up everything that was among them, v'yishbor lemitzrayim, and he, I'm going to say, he sold to the Egyptians. Vayechazak hara'av be'eretz Mitzrayim, and the famine was strong in the, it became stronger in the land of Egypt. It was, it just took over everything. Okay. Al kol p'nei ha'aretz, Rashi, right? Mi hem p'nei ha'aretz, what do we mean by the face of the earth? Elu ha'ashirim, these are the wealthy people. In other words, it even affected them, okay? It kol asher bahem, amongst all who was amongst them, everything among them. Ketargumo di bahon ibura, the uh, Aramaic translation, the Onkelos, okay, uh, that ibura would be grain, right, something produce that was uh, everything, in other words, everything, all the, all the produce that was there, it all was affected by the famine. Vayishbor uh, lemitzrayim, he sold it to Egypt. Shever lashon mecher. So Rashi says that this word shever, right? Lishbor generally can mean to to break, right? But he says this has the connotation of selling, right? Vlashon kinyan, and also buying, acquiring. So the word shever has the connotation of. Um, buying and selling, or selling and buying, if we're going to go with Rashi's order. So here, in this context, it has the idea of selling. So when it says, um, when, when Jacob says this to his sons, he says, buy for us a little bit of food, uh, and there, of course, it has to do with the idea of buying. For altomar eno ki im betua, and don't don't claim that this word shever only applies to produce. Sheaf bayayin vechalav matzinu, because we find this word being used in connection with wine and milk, as in in Isaiah fifty five. Ulechu v'shivru, go and buy, belo kesef, without money, uvalo mechir, without any uh, transaction, or without a purchase, so to speak, yayin v'chalav, go and purchase wine and, <coughs> and milk. And here wine and milk has to do with Torah, with knowledge. But nevertheless, it says specifically wine and milk. So, if I, before I move on to a different subject, I just want to give you an opportunity to react if you'd like to, you know, if you have anything you'd like to add to what we just read, what we just covered. All right, I'm going to assume there, that. There, yeah, ahead, there is please. something, Rabbi, in uh, uh, Professor Klein's book about the Hebrew language. Yes. He says that some people want to take the word shever. Mm -hmm. meaning to buy grain or to sell grain mm -hmm. as coming from the word bar bet resh yes meaning grain yes um but he doesn't really accept that he thinks it's i don't know i think i guess he thinks it's connected to the other meaning of shever which mm -hmm. as you said was to break mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and and, and what did you say? The, I'm sorry. What did you say the other meaning was? Bar to means break. great. Yeah, and to bar what? means great. Sorry. Go ahead, Shira Beth. Go ahead. I'm interrupting oh, wait. you. Oh, wait a minute. No, no. I'm sorry. I made a mistake. He's he the the first meaning of the shoresh is to break. B r e a k. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. To break. However, now I should have get, gotten my microphone glass out here. He says he thinks it's probably actually from the third meaning, uh, which is a third meaning of this shoresh means corn or grain. Uh, probably all derived from shever to break and literally meaning broken or threshed. So, you know, in order to eat the grain, you have to break it. Uh, so that it came to mean that which is broken, meaning grain. That's it. <laughs> That's all I got about that. But I thought that was cool. Right. And of course, Rashi argues with that. He, he says, don't, don't say it only applies to grain, that it applies to any kind of purchase that's involved. So... I am. Um, yeah. I, I was thinking that uh, 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 Jacob uh, uh, sent gifts to uh, uh, to Joseph, who was supposed to be the viceroy. He sent uh, uh, all kinds of gifts back to the uh, uh, to uh, you know Egypt, uh, thinking that maybe uh, uh, the uh, he won't he won't ask for Benjamin. He's hoping well, he won't. Ask this is not what we're reading right now. Oh. No, no, that's, we're anticipating. That only comes up later on. We may get to it, uh, but it's not, it's not uh, in today's. Sorry. Uh, right now. No, it's okay. It's all right. We'll, we'll, we'll catch the question or the point uh, in its context. All right, let me get, so now I'm going to move on to what I said I would do. And that is a comparison and similarity between Hanukkah and Christmas. So if we take a look at Hanukkah and, and ask ourselves, what is Hanukkah really about? What are the dynamics of Hanukkah? This is how I understand them. Uh, what had happened was that the Greeks had polluted the temple, even set up a statue of Apollo, according to some stories, and taken this temple and, and de dedicated it to an idol. Yeah, well, initially, the whole I idea of the temple is that it was a nexus, that it was a connecting link between heaven and earth and all that that means, right? That the idea is that there was an ability to connect the divine into this world and that that is a, a great theme that has to do certainly uh, with, with many religions, if not all, but certainly Judaism and in terms of what the temple, the temple represented was that it was a connecting point. Uh, that's, you know, you've got the symbolism of Jerusalem, you know, being the navel of the world, of the then known world in its position between Asia, <laughs> Europe, and Africa. Uh, but the very location of it and the idea that this was, and the n idea of the navel, right? Uh, that, that this, that all of, you know, that reality, uh, blessing, all these things, that Jerusalem was this sort of, this, this point at which all of this entered. It was a, that connecting point. And here- well, Who were the Maccabees? Uh, let's, just let me, let me keep going, if you, if you will, all right? Um, so, so that they had experienced <clears throat> this, and of course, I think a big, big um, spiritual theme at that moment is rejection the idea of divine rejection, that they were unworthy of this particular blessing, which was what you might even call it the ultimate blessing, and that they were no longer worthy about it, for it, and that that's why this had happened to them, and why the temple had become um, desecrated. Um, so we do have the story of the Maccabees. They are the essentially that we're talking about Mattathias, who was a priest in Modin, and his five sons, and and the band that they formed, and to to uh, try and uh, ward off the the tyranny of the um, the these uh, 
Greeks. It was one of the one of the three empires, part of the um, empire of Alexander the Great. Okay, uh, and um, of course they were successful. That's what we read. That miraculously they were successful. And excuse Come me, I have a dog that I have to get in my room. To, Hold on a I second. Have to go. Okay. Thank you. It reminds me of Doc Martin. Does anybody here watch Doc Martin? <laughs> Got to get the dog out of there. So I think I'm going to tell the rabbi I have to go. To I'm sorry, I can't just stay. I have okay. to get my eyes to take care. Okay, of. That's Thank okay, Harlan. You you can check in yeah. this later on on YouTube. Bye, okay? Harlan. Right. Bye, Harlan. Okay. Take care. I know. Bye, Harlan. Okay. okay. Bye. So let me let me keep going with this. Right. So the Maccabees you, were successful. You, you yes. might want to mute um, Harlan's computer. If it, so okay. So they were successful, miraculously. I mean, here was a very small band that was successful against an, an, um, an army of an empire. And uh, so they were able to, of course, get back to the temple. And they see the temple basically desecrated and, um, you know, hardly, hardly in a situation where it, it's supposed to function the way it's supposed to function. And they still, I believe, uttermost in their mind are wondering if this rejection, if they're still rejected. And so the miracle of the oil, that when they found this tiny little bit of, of pure oil, that they could in fact use, and they could, and they lit the menorah. That when it, when in fact the menorah remained alight, to give them enough time, as the story goes, to create more oil for that lamp, because it was the purest of pure oils, like the first drop taken in the crushing of the olive. This had to be for them a sign of divine favor and that in fact the temple was functioning the way it was supposed to function and that God had not rejected them and that in fact there still was this divine connection that they had. Now if we look at if we look at Christmas it is essentially the same idea and that is the idea that that the divine through that they understand that through Jesus, right? Through the birth of Jesus, they understand that it is a connection between the divine and this world that we live in. Um, there's a wonderful um, statement that says, you know, what Jesus is, what Jesus represents to Christianity, Torah represents to Judaism, right? It's not Moses, it's Torah. And the whole idea is that when we take Torah, Torah in its, with all its rules and all its ideas and stuff like that, allows us to learn what it is to bring God into ourselves. And the temple itself is a metaphor for us as human beings to, to be able to bring divinity into ourselves. And of course, um, Jesus represents that divinity to Christians. So you bring divinity by performing the divine will, by identifying your very self with divine will. And so in that sense, both, both of them actually have a very similar notion. And of course, the Christmas tree and the Yule log, for those of you who are familiar with it, there was also this also a custom not only of the Christmas tree, which everybody knows about, but also the idea of taking this log and burning it and the smoke from the log going up through the chimney into the heavens. Both trees and chimneys represent a nexus between heaven and earth, which again, right, is the temple where the temple comes in. And the sacrifices, right, where you had the smoke of the sacrifices, etc., going up to heaven. You have that idea. You have both ha festivals occurring in the darkest time of the year. And the idea that despite how terrible things may be, there is that spark 
of divine presence that can sometimes happen at the darkest of times. And it is interesting that both occur on the 25th of, month, of the month, right? The first day of Hanukkah, 25th of Kislev. First day of Christmas, or Christmas occurs on the 25th of December. Maybe just a coincidence? I don't think so. And, and there's, another, there's another connection too. And that is if you look at the dreidel, and you look at the letters of the dreidel, nun, gimel, he, shin, right? And I believe the dreidel actually and those letters came from, from outside of Israel because in Israel it's nun, gimel, he, pe, but I don't think that's where the dreidel started and, you, and I'll tell you why right now. Because if you take the letters nun, 50, gimel, 3, so that's 53, he is 5, so that's 58, and shin is 300, so 358, if I'm keeping these numbers in my head, right? And you take the word Mashiach, right? Mem, 40. Shin is 300. Yud is 10, 350. And Chet is 8, 358. It's the same gematria. So that this, this dreidel, which probably has more more symbolism than I'm capable of coming up with right now, right, is actually is a suggestive of that as well. You know, language is language, and sometimes um, we get caught up with language and don't realize that it's it's more a matter of trying to communicate ideas, and very often, you know, the, the issue is how appealing those ideas are and how they strike our minds and how they strike our hearts. And sometimes you can express the exact same thought, but if but you can express it in one way that somehow touches people and 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 reaches, you know, the inner place. And you can and and you can put it a different way and say exactly the same thing basically and it doesn't touch them at all. And it could be that, that the metaphor of Jesus and, and, and the ideas that go along with, with a human being in that, in that particular regard, you know, touched more people or touched people in a way that, that for, for the Jewish people, that is not the metaphor that appeals to us. That the idea of Torah and its, and its laws and the idea of that spiritual discipline is something that appeals to us or to a group of people in a different kind of way. But I really do think that actually at the very basis, since they're both essentially talking about a time when the divine, the element of the divine origin of this world, of this universe, um, is able to make a connection with humanity and with, with people and with the world is actually the same idea. And that's why I think Christmas and Hanukkah actually are both in very different ways giving the same message. Love yeah. it. Thank you so much. Wow. If you could see me right now, I'm sitting here with my mouth open. <laughs> Thank well, you. Sadly, yeah. there's been a lot of blood spilt and a lot of, you know, a lot of anger and jealousy and stuff that has really messed up. Uh, the op the ability to be open to the fact that we're all here to try and accomplish the same thing, which is to bring heaven down to earth. And and it's Earth's true that Jesus oh. Jesus transmitted Torah, also. Yes, I mean that's not the, necessarily the way the gospels. You know, the, the gospels have a different kind of message to give there. Uh, you know, and 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 especially when you come down to Paul and and Paul's writings that are part of the New Testament, um, Paul takes a a different stance about the idea of a religious discipline, uh, and uh, there's a there's a fundamental argument you might say or deb debate regarding the idea of whether or not God cares whether we keep our dishes separate etc etc or whether those really aren't that important you know from a Jewish perspective being able to go into these particular details are the ways in which we actually demonstrate that we love God with all our hearts, with all our souls and with all our might and, and frankly you know you look at the whole rabbinic you know, enterprise and the enterprise um, that takes that into account is actually the, the very heart of Judaism that um, works both ways. Yeah, go ahead. 
I just wanted to make a, another connection. And I think it's one that you had taught me about earlier, but um, that um, if, you know, because maybe historically Jesus's birth date is questionable that it happened or debatable when it is, mm -hmm. but let's say it is the t December 25th, which is now used to commemorate his birth date. And then of course the eighth day would be January 1st, right. which is, his, would be his bris date. Yes. And so at January 1st, which is, you know, a celebration that you can connect to Jesus in that way, but also with the Hanukkah, I'm going a little bit further than what you had originally, with Hanukkah, and you're talking about the word, you know, meaning dedication, but it's actually a time of rededicating the, the temple, yes. not, not the original dedication. Right. right. So it's kind of like, um, you know, Rabbi, you were saying whether you were worthy, and this is showing. It's a it's a little born againish to mm -hmm. have the rededication, uh -huh. and so with Jesus is, you know, um, the, gen the the big celebration of um, the day of Jesus's bris, bris, which is the day he would have been dedicated to God yes. in Judaism. So I see, you know, various ways, and there's more to it, but that's the the short version to connect those. Uh, Christians celebrate that. Yes, they do. It's in it's they in their they liturgical yeah. cal calendar. If right. you get a farmer's yes. almanac and look at the calendar, the f calendar part of the for farmer's almanac, which represents a liturgical calendar, you'll see next to January first the words C R C C I R C, standing for circumcision, and. Um, in fact, Tish Levy, I think, remembers Circumcision Day, that New Year's Day was called Circumcision Day. Uh, I need to add one other thing, that part of this connection with the divine is immortality. And as I have mentioned right in one of our sessions just recently, how the circumcision ceremony, remember, with Joseph wanting the Egyptians to be circumcised and how he wanted to give them that opportunity to become immortal? So likewise, um, within, within Jewish tradition, uh, the idea of the divine entering into this world is, our, is also linked with the idea of immortality. Yeah, and, and for people who um, bring the divine into this world through their practices, mm -hmm. they are um, ensuring, at least from a specific perspective, some type of immortality. Yes. I mean, there's, there's a lot of what I would consider goodness involved in all of this that operates on a lot of different levels, not just on the spiritual level, but even on the pragmatic level. I, I have a quick question about yes. the, the, the dreidel. Yes. So um, you, you mentioned, you know, the, the Moshiach, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. the numbers, but what's the connection to Christmas? Is it because, you know, um, Jesus is considered, you know, the, the divine entity or, okay. So no, he's considered the Messiah. They consider the Messiah. Jesus yeah, yeah. the Messiah. Right, right, yes. right. So that's, okay. You didn't spell that, but okay. I got no, I'm it. glad, right. I'm glad you got me to spell it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay. No, no. That's what I thought, but I just wanted to yes. double. Okay, thanks. Right, right. Um, you know, I'm just, in my own mind, I'm trying to sort of puzzle out the idea of, you know, the dreidel being... And it's not maybe this is just a you know random thought that occurred to me right now is the idea that we don't control it that in a sense you know we get the dreidel spinning but what side it lands on is a purely you know random that's beyond our control and so that there's this sort of little bit of a balance between the fact that the that the that the maccabees got the dreidel spinning right but the fact that the dreidel landed right was up to the divine just just a thought no it's a great thought yeah no that yeah the the, the game of chance right so yes, exactly. and, yeah. that we don't control that the elements yeah. that we don't control yep so yeah no i've played around with this for a while as you can tell uh so it's, and the other connection is that um, all the Jewish composers who, who wrote Christmas songs, <laughs> musicians who recorded Christmas albums. I'm, I'm, so, I'm yep. so glad you said that. <laughs> business is business. Huh? That's, that's the issue. Well, we do have a few minutes. If you want, to, we can go back to the, the
the text, but given given the timeliness of this, I did want to share that that issue, and I th hopefully people find it interesting. So, more to connect us than to divide us. All right, we'll take another verse. So, so what's happening now, by the way, in this back to the Joseph story, is that the screw is turning. The screw is turning, right? Because now, right through all these events, right, the brothers are going to have to show up again. That's that's the turning of the screw here. So, v'chol ha'aretz, now the entire land, ba'u Mitzrayim, came to Egypt, lishbor el Yosef, to buy from Joseph. Ki chazak ha'ra'av v'chol ha'aretz, because the famine was so great, was so strong in all the earth, in all the land. So let's take a look. So the, the, the syntax here is a little bit, the Hebrew syntax is a little bit different, difficult. So Rashi is going to help us with this. V'chol ha'aretz ba'u Mitzrayim. And, the, you know, everyone in the, on, on, uh, in the land came to Egypt, El Yosef to Joseph, Lishbor to purchase, right, to trade, whatever. The im tidrashehu kisidro, right, but if you, if you in fact explain it, if you try to understand this, is it in the, in the order of the words given, right? So, v'chol ha'aretz ba'u mitzrayim el yosef, let's see. Uh, no, so notice he's got the word lishbor el yosef, right? Anyway, Hayatza Richlitov, it should have actually written, if we want to understand it, it should the text should have written Lishbor Min Yosef to buy from Joseph, not to buy to Joseph. In other words, so the the, the way the Hebrew is actually written, the the what Rashi the point that Rashi is saying is that it should have said Vehula Aretz Bahu Mitzrayim Lishbor Min Yosef. And in fact, this is sort of out of order, and that you could read the sentence, V'chol ha'aretz bahu mitzrayim el Yosef lishbor. Right? So he's, that's what the point is that, that he's making here, that to, to really understand this, this sentence in a way, you have to either change a little word here or there, or, um, or flip it around. So here we go. So you see what I mean? V'chol ha'aretz bahu mitzrayim el Yosef lishbor. Right? Uh, so, again, though, it's not so clear what is the point, though. I understand what Rashi is saying, makes sense, but does he have a, another point, or, or does the Torah have some other point to make in the fact that it doesn't say it the way that might make sense? So, again, I think that's sort of room now for us to think about and, and to see what, what that could mean if there's any additional meaning but in the fact that, that it's out of order. I'll take one more, the first verse of chapter 42. Here we go. Vayar Yaakov ki shever b'mitzrayim. So look at this. So there's the word shever, which would imply grain here, right? Or that they are maybe, you know, that they're trading in grain in, in Egypt or trading in food in Egypt. So Jacob saw that there was Shever in Mitzrayim, right? However we want to try and translate that. Vayomer Yaakov Levanav, and so Jacob said to his sons, Lama tit ra'u. We could say from the word ra'a, resh alef hey, right? Why do you look at each other? Why are you looking at each other? But this sentence here is actually begging for interpretation and I've got given our time constraints. I'm going to simply put the bookmark in here, and uh, and put the uh, little arrow in here as well. So let's do that, and we'll start with God's help tomorrow, right here, starting chapter 42. And I'm going to stop the share and stop the recording and look forward to hope that people will enjoy this session.